This is 9-11 Free Talk. Gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Now Let Me Free Fall. My name is Andy Steele, and I am the host. Tonight, we'll be joined by AE911 Truth founder Richard Gage and AE911 Truth's Director of Strategy and Development, Ted Walter. They're going to be giving a report on what we did on this year's 9 11 anniversary, all the events taking place across the country, and the path forward, where we're going to go from here. Now, quick uh, note on tonight's episode, the recorder that I typically use for these shows, the one that records my own voice in crystal clear quality, failed to work this time. I'm not sure what exactly happened, uh, some kind of technology glitch that I can't get to the bottom of, uh, so I had to use my backup recording of this, so I sound like I'm on the phone just like the guests do. Not a big deal, you can still hear the interview just fine, uh, just not in the perfect quality that uh, usually comes in, at least uh, on my end of the conversation. So I'm going to get on top of that. I think I'm going to use a different kind of software in the future. But I just wanted to note that for you before you heard the interview tonight, so you're not wondering why it sounds a little different. So with that said, I'm going to play the interview for you right now. The views expressed on this show by guests and the hosts on issues outside of the 9-11 controlled demolition evidence are the opinions of those individuals alone and do not necessarily reflect those of architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. This week, our previous guests are back to give us some important updates on our outreach all over the country, really, but also focusing on Washington, D.C. Uh, my first guest is Richard Gage, AIA. He's a San Francisco Bay Area architect of 30 years. He's a member of the American Institute of Architects, and he is the founder and president of Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truths, and we represent currently more than 3,000 architects and engineers who have signed our petition demanding a new investigation of the destruction of all three World Trade Center skyscrapers on September 11th. Uh, during Richard's architectural career, he worked on most type of building construction, including numerous fireproof steel frame buildings. He knows his stuff, folks, and he's been hard at work bringing this message and this information to the people who need to hear it the most, particularly this week. And you'll be hearing all about it first. Richard, I just want to say welcome back to 9-11 Free Fall. Thank you, Andy. Awesome to be here with you. And he's joined by Ted Walter, who is the Director of Strategy and Development here at AE. He holds a Master's of Public Policy degree from the University of California, Berkeley. Prior to his current role with AE 9-11 Truth, he was Director of NYC CAN's 2014 High-Rise Safety Initiative, Volunteer Campaign Manager for AE 9-11 Truth Rethink Campaign in 2013, and director of NYC CAN's 2009 Ballot Initiative. He's the author of the booklet Beyond Misinformation and the 13-page World Trade Center Physics publication. And uh, Ted's there for many of the cool things that have happened over the years in AE 11 Truth's history. So, Ted, great to have you back on. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Andy. Always a pleasure. So we got a lot to go over with our supporters. It's been a busy several weeks here at AE 9-11 Truth, and uh, you'd almost like to take a breather, but we're going to be kicking off the post-9-11 world for this year, as I call it, uh, meaning post-9-11 anniversary world, with some major outreach off the heels of what we have done so far in the past month, and we had a lot going on, and you and Ted were here to talk about what was coming. We're going to talk about what happened. Uh, Richard, please begin, though, by talking about why this year the anniversary was so important in your view. Well, we had the release of some major 
cannonballs, I call them, in our arsenal to use against the wall of denial out there, 9-11 truth denial. And one of them was the uh, four-year, $300,000 study of Building 7, finite element analysis. And this was done by the University of Alaska. And it was released on September 3rd. And this was an extraordinary deal for us because we were working on it for four years. And all of a sudden, hey, it's out. It's like it's like this cannonball has been loosed on the engineering and architecture world and the media. And a lot of people are working with this study, which concludes, by the way, that fire could not have brought this building down. Of course, we're talking about Building 7, a 47-story skyscraper that collapses after witnesses hear explosions on the afternoon of 9-11 straight down uniformly, symmetrically into its own footprint in under seven seconds in the exact manner of a classic controlled demolition. And, of course, the official story says that fire brought this building down and the Holsey Report, which we also call the Alaska Report, which we also call the UAF Report. We have a lot of names for it. Uh, but this report just pulls the rug out from underneath the NIST report. NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology, who was tasked by Congress to explain these collapses to the American people. Not only did he conclude that fire could not have caused the collapse of this building, uh, but he actually goes on to show us what could have been responsible that is to say, what set of behaviors in the building had to have happened for it to fall in the way we all saw in the video. And, of course, that amounts to the removal instantly, virtually, of all the columns in the building. Well, what can do that, Andy? My guess would be controlled demolition. <laughs> that's a good guess. I think that's right. I mean, we're talking about instantaneous removal uh, of the core columns followed a second later. By the exterior columns, yeah, fire doesn't do that, especially the few small scattered fires that we saw in that building. That's right. As I said on the last show, what the University of Alaska study has done is has taken what has been intuitive for most people listening to this show, watching World Trade Center 7 come down, knowing instantly that fire cannot do this to a steel frame high rise, 47 stories, straight down, symmetrical, doesn't happen unless you have pre-placed explosives, the people who uh, don't turn their eyes away from this fact know this intuitively, and then they look at the evidence. But now we've got this report that lays it out, that puts a stamp of approval on what we've been saying, and it's going to be hard for the powers that be to ignore. That's why I love it so much. Uh, Ted, same question to you in your own view. Why this year, why is it so important to really hit the institutions hard with this information now? Well, I think the second cannonball that Richard was referring to when he said we were uh, releasing a number of cannonballs against the wall of denial of 9-11 truth is the recent emergence of the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District as a voice in New York uh, calling for a new investigation into the events of 9-11. Uh, as many listeners of this show will know, Franklin Square Munson Fire District, uh, on July 24th, uh, the five commissioners oversee this fire district unanimously passed a resolution calling for a new investigation. They were supporting the ongoing grand jury investigation that's happening in Lower Manhattan that was initiated by the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, Jeffrey Berman, uh, and they were also calling on any other, all other government entities to open their own investigations into the events of 9-11. Uh, since that happened, you know, that was not a one-time shot. They uh, have continued their efforts, and they're extremely active, and their goal over the next, you know, say, one to two years is to rally the entire fire service in the state of New York and, and beyond, really, to join their call for a new investigation. And so what was so special about this particular September 11th anniversary was that their lead spokesperson, uh, Commissioner Christopher Joya, joined us in Washington, D.C. Uh, as many supporters know, we've been going to Washington, D.C. the last couple of years. 
Uh, we've been pushing uh, for Congress to introduce and pass the Bobby McElvain World Trade Center Investigation Act, which would establish a select committee in either chamber of Congress to reinvestigate the destruction of the three World Trade Center towers. This time, we added a lot of ammo to that campaign, uh, bringing Commissioner Joya down to D.C. Uh, to join us. Uh, there was also the chair of the commission, Joseph Torregrosa, was supposed to come and join us, but he, um, as some folks may know, he, along with Joya, uh, was a first responder in the weeks after 9-11, and today is um, suffering extreme health effects uh, as a result of breathing the deadly toxins that were down there after 9-11. So he was not able to come, unfortunately. Nevertheless, we had Commissioner Joya there with us, uh, Richard Gage, of course, and all of our staffs at AE 911 Truth were there, as well as Bob McElvain and Helen McElvain, uh, the parents of Bobby McElvain, who was killed on 9 11 uh, by an explosion while he was entering the lobby of the North Tower, and then David Meiswinkle, who is president of the Lawyers Committee for 9 11 Inquiry, uh, who we have partnered with in the past year, really in the past three years, uh, to help move this issue forward in the legal realm as well. And so all of these folks came together on the anniversary in Washington, D.C., really to capitalize and send out the signal even further, amplify the message of the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District that it's time for a new investigation and that the fire service is coming and they will grow in the years ahead to the point where Congress has no choice, especially the delegation from New York State, has no choice but to champion a new investigation in Congress. And so it was very special for that reason, and I'm sure a lot of people tuned in. Um, if you haven't seen the press conference yet, I think it's a very, very powerful hour of speeches by all the folks I just mentioned. I would encourage you to go to our website, 8911truth.org, and watch those speeches. Uh, Richard gives a very nice, succinct summary of the findings of the UAF World Trade Center 7 study. Dave Meiswick gives a great update on the efforts of the Lawyers Committee right now, including the recent filing of a mandamus lawsuit against the U.S. Attorney in order uh, to get the U.S. Attorney to disclose some information about the status of the grand jury investigation that was initiated last year, as well as very beautiful and poignant speeches by Bob McElvain and Christopher Joya. Absolutely. And we're going to be talking about that press conference a little more in depth, talking a little behind-the-scenes talk here on this show. I want to make sure, though, that we touch upon the presentations that happened at the two universities, because we talked about it in the last episode, and uh, I want our supporters to, to get an update. This all began on September the 3rd at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Uh, there was a link, a live stream of Leroy Halsey's presentation. If you did not watch it, many people have grabbed the video and put it up on YouTube. Actually, during my uh, two weeks off from Freefall to do the anniversary work, I put one of those YouTube videos up on Freefall's uh, top page. So it'll probably disappear by the time this show airs, but you can still go into YouTube, type in Leroy Halsey, a WTC7 study, and uh, I'm sure it will come up for you. But Richard, tell us about your impression of that first event, the presentation at UAF. Yes, um, Professor Holsey, whom I just spoke with, um, uh, told me that he had his, his students there and, and he required them to actually give feedback, and he's gotten some great feedback from them uh, to actually help him to simplify this presentation even more so that uh, – those who just mostly need the overview uh, can get that, and those who want to go into the details, uh, fascinating details, uh, by the way, can, can get that also by delving deeper. For instance, he uh, talked uh, about the NIST assumptions. NIST made a whole bunch of assumptions that were flat out wrong. Now, I would call these fraudulent. He doesn't use that kind of language in his report or his presentation on the third, but in this, for instance, made the exterior wall of Building Seven in the northeast corner infinitely stiff, which forced the concrete slab under thermal loading from the fire uh, to move toward the elevators. Why is that important? Because this whole theory is that this girder was pushed off of its seat on this column seventy-nine, allowing it to uh, fall. Then and, and then they have nine successive uh, floors that have failed 
allowing column 79 to buckle and then the whole thing, the interior of the building, uh, caves in on itself. Well, Professor Halsey reveals uh, five or six key structural omissions in addition uh, to the input data being uh, contrived, like we, with regard to the exterior wall, NIST omits um, stiffeners uh, on the girder, which kept, would have kept it from falling off the bearing seat. Uh, he shows that NIST omits the shear studs that would be tying the girder to the top of the plate. He exposes uh, that they omit other key structural components, such as the side plates on column 79, which would have trapped that girder from moving anywhere. So this is just the beginning. So what's fascinating about what Professor Halsey revealed that day is that he took all of those inaccurate assumptions of NIST and put them in his uh, model anyway. And said, well, okay, well, could I get the building to fall? You know, actually modeling this assumption. And so he finds that there's no local collapse whatsoever. Uh, so he says, well, what do I have to do to get this building to collapse? So he, he takes out um, six columns. And uh, sure enough, you take out six columns and the load is transferred to the exterior uh, columns. And then, but then it begins to tip over. It does tip over, uh, which is what we'd expect. If you kicked in the knee, you're going to fall, you know, toward that direction. Uh, that's that's uh, plausible. But that's not the way the building fell over. In the video, we have 11 videos of this building's collapse. So he, he says, well, what do I have to do to get it to fall the way it fell in the uh, actual video? So he finds he has to take out uh, all the columns on at least eight floors initially, uh, the interior columns followed a second later by the exterior columns. And then, by God, the building falls exactly like the videos. So that's what's fascinating about this study. And it's the architecture, uh, the input data and so forth is completely open. People can review it. Unlike NIST's data, which is a black box, they actually said in a response to a Freedom of Information Act request, uh, we can't give you this data. It might jeopardize public safety. Well, God, it, it certainly jeopardizes public safety to withhold this information from uh, those of us who are architects and engineers responsible for ensuring the public safety. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm real excited about uh, that September 3rd release at the University of Alaska in Fairbanks and the work uh, that uh, Professor Halsey has done, because we're going to get it everywhere uh, throughout the United States and around the world during this open public comment period over the next two months. I love how you pointed this out, Richard. Dr. Leroy Halsey took all of NIST's assumptions, tried it out, and still could not get the building to fail. It makes you wonder what NIST did if they even managed to get the building to fall at all. I mean, regarding the input data that they won't disclose, I don't want to speculate, but uh, I would like to know how they came to their conclusions if Dr. Halsey couldn't even take all of their wild assumptions, all of their inaccurate assumptions, and get the same result. The revelation at the end that he would have to remove eight stories of columns and then exterior columns a second later to bring the building down exactly as we saw it. We can see it in the video, in the animations, right there. The UAF has uh, concluded that what NIST has said is impossible. So this was presented at UAF. The video is out there. We had another event up in Berkeley. And, uh, Ted, I'm going to let you introduce this event, and then I'll give my update from it, because I'm the only one here on the show right now that was actually at the event. Uh, but, Ted, tell our audience what happened on September 5th up there at uh, UC Berkeley. Sure, Andy. Well, uh, first, I just want to make a quick comment about um, when you were talking about the building tipping over, um, just so all the folks out there, especially the folks who aren't engineers or architects, understand what that particular portion of the study was about, and I'll give you sort of the layman's description of it. What was going on there, what Dr. Holy was simulating, was the way that NIST says that the building failed was that you started off by losing a few core columns, starting with one and then two others, on the eastern side of the building, inside the building, 
and that once those core columns failed, that caused the next row of core columns to fail and the next row and the next row. What Dr. Holsey's team found was that if you remove those core, three core columns, nothing actually happens to the building, just removing those three core columns. So they had to go, uh, right there, you can't get in this scenario to work. They had to go to the next step and remove the next row of core columns over towards the west. What they found was when you remove those six core columns, what actually starts to happen to the building is because these columns are on the eastern side of the building, all the columns on the perimeter on the southeastern side of the building, those columns start to become overloaded. Those columns fail, and as those columns fail, you start to get more failures throughout the building. But because you have all these failures happening initially in the southeast side of the building, the building ends up tipping over. So before you can even get to all of the core columns failing east to west that NIST uh, asserts, before you can even get that far to the point where all the core columns have failed and you just have the exterior sitting there as a hollow shell, which then fails according to NIST, before you can even get that far, if you started losing those core columns on the eastern side of the building, the building is going to tip over to the southeast. And that's what you would expect when a skyscraper actually loses lots of columns in, in a particular area of the building. It's going to fall asymmetrically. The same thing that Richard and so many others have been talking about for, you know, the better part of 18 years. Uh, so that's why you see in some of those simulations the building tipping to the southeast. There's another simulation where the building tips to the southwest. This is actually where Dr. Halsey simulated removing all of the core columns at the same time to see what effect that could have on the building. And because the building is a trapezoidal shape, meaning it's asymmetrical and has less support columns um, on the perimeter on the southern side, and because they simulate it with some of the core, some of those exterior columns being severed as a result of the debris, they get the building tipping to the southwest. Again, this is the kind of behavior that you would expect a building to undergo when it has, let's say, a certain degree of structural failures occurring within it and loss of, loss of columns. The idea of a building coming straight down into its footprint, I mean, you could try it a million different ways. Um, there, there's not a lot of, I think what Dr. Holsey discovered is there's not a lot of things that can do that aside from the near simultaneous failure of every column in the building, starting with the core, then the exterior columns about a second later. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, I think the September 5th presentation, um, this happened two days after the release of the report um, in Berkeley at the, uh, at the faculty club on the UC Berkeley campus. A lot of the engineers who are actually on our board of directors, Kamal Obeid uh, and Roland Engel were present there, as well as several other engineers who have been working diligently with a and and Truth for the last several years. And then we had, I would say, from what I understand, a handful of students from the, Ber from the Berkeley Engineering Program show up, uh, a lot of other interested architects and engineers in the area, some supporters, um, and uh, I'm not going to go into describing how it went because you were there, Andy, so let's get your take on it. But I think it was really good that uh, Dr. Holsey went there and gave that presentation on the Berkeley campus. As, as everybody knows, most people listening to this know, A United Love and Truth was founded in Berkeley uh, in the San Francisco Bay Area, and so it was important that we brought Dr. Dr. Holsey there to give that presentation. Um, and I think that the, the engineers uh, who were present, the students who were present, got a lot out of that presentation. And it was great to have Dr. Halsey make that trip and give that presentation. Right. And this was actually the first time I met Dr. Halsey in person. So it was a great honor to do that and uh, a great day. And I consider this event a success. I think that we had a reasonably uh, filled audience in there. We did have many uh, engineers in the audience. There were some students that came, some very impassioned. Now, just a full disclosure, I got put on door duty to help people come in. Because when Leroy Halsey is talking, we don't want the outside noise in the hallway. There was another event going on across the hall, so we had to close the door, but someone might show up late. So I was out in the hallway watching the door and, and helping people in if they came late. But I did come in during the Q&A, and, and Dr. Halsey gave uh, pretty much the same presentation that he gave at UAF. But the Q&A was where it really got interesting because uh, there were students there who were very impassioned. There was even one student, I want to identify him by name, but he was fixated on this presentation, according to Kelly, our COO, who was present in the room there. 
a lot of great back and forth and a lot of great interest in this and from a core group of young people. Now, while I was out in the hallway, students were coming back from some kind of insurance industry event and uh, a lot of them were in there. They had food, but they would come by thinking that we were the insurance industry event or somehow affiliated with it. I would clarify for them that they weren't. Uh, but I would talk to them about Building 7, and many of them said that they had already heard about this and showed some genuine interest, even if they were on their way to a class or something else at the moment. And I got two friends talking about it. One one kid had not heard of Building 7 before, and the other one had, and they started discussing it right there. So I got some outreach done in the hallway, but a very successful, very worthwhile event down there. And Richard, I want to know, I mean, are we done? Are we going to reach out to any other universities? And are we open to doing any uh, presentations at other universities? Absolutely. Um, We are going to ask all of our 3,000 architects and engineers who are signed on to our petition, of course, demanding a new investigation, to take this study to their, it's 128 pages, uh, take it to the dean of their local school where they came from uh, and get them to review it, to comment on it, and to invite uh, our project due diligence team to come and give a presentation uh, at the university about the study. Uh, Professor Holsey himself is is tied up uh, with comments uh, that uh, have begun coming in, and he's got to produce the final report by January. Uh, but we want to um, send the the study ourselves also to all of the engineering uh, universities in the country. And um, we're going to be about that uh, coming up here very shortly. We're going to try to get emails out as well and just do whatever we can to make the fuss. Because, I mean, here is the university study with open architecture. It's, it's, it's not a black box. You know, it's concluded that NIST, who was responsible for the official story of this building's collapse, which nobody buys once they actually see the video of this building's collapse, they know it didn't come down by fire. And so here is the definitive study that refutes that piece by piece, pulls the rug out from under it. And buildings, why is Building 7 important? Well, Building 7 was the third skyscraper to collapse on 9-11. Uh, the, the Twin Towers, more well-known, are the foundation of the uh, global war on terror. You know, we've lost $6.5 trillion dollars. Now, on this global war on terror, uh, which has also consumed our uh, civil liberties and dismantled them through the Patriot Act, the Military Commission Act, et cetera. We've invaded two countries, uh, and, and, and more countries have been invaded since. But starting with Afghanistan and Iraq, uh, two million people have been killed. It all goes back to the Twin Towers, but people are often too damaged to evaluate um, clearly the evidence at the Twin Towers because we, we were filled with shock and awe on that day. But when we show them Building 7 and what really happened there, uh, they have an open mind. According to the official story, nobody died at Building 7. So uh, we don't, we're not laced with the trauma that we are with regard to the Twin Towers, and everybody can see instantly that this is a controlled demolition. And the study simply... Uh, proves it to the academics who tend to be more open-minded to that type of information. They're curious. They can't stop themselves from looking at a good finite element analysis. <laughs> so we're, we've got it to give them. And we think this will uh, turn things upside down uh, in, in the uh, architecture and engineering industry. So that's what we're going to be about, Andy. Exactly. Can't turn away from a good finite element analysis. I like that. It's like some <laughs> light reading before bed. So, uh, Richard, you went to New York City, and actually Ted was at the event as well, but this was a lawyer's committee event. There were a lot of good speakers, well-known speakers in the truth community there. Tell us about that, and also tell us what you talked about when you were speaking there. This uh, was an event on September 7th, Saturday, in New York. 250 people packed the Unitarian Church. We were invited to speak, and uh, along with, uh, I think, five or six others, including Gary Knoll 
including Bill uh, Binney, who couldn't come due to an illness uh, surgery. Um, but Gary Wiebe was sent in his stead, who did a great job um, providing context for uh, secrecy and surveillance of American people. Gary Null spoke uh, quite eloquently as well, and uh, Dave Meiswinkle from the Lawyers Committee talking about these lawsuits that are going to be helpful in reinforcing the openness of the U.S. attorney about the grand jury, which he is compelled to impanel to review the evidence that we've been talking about for 12 years now at Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. We also had, um, of course, Chris Joya, who, as Ted mentioned, has been just a pioneer in the firefighter uh, realm, uh, emerged as this Marine who is just taking by storm this denial of 9-11 truth. Uh, he will be working uh, to get all firefighting uh, associations and districts to uh, join him in a call for a new investigation. And we're all excited uh, about that. I announced the release of the Holsey study in my talk and the uh, initial evidence, as we highlighted here, about Building 7's uh, controlled demolition. So all of this works very well together, uh, these, these speeches in New York. And I was just real excited to present for the first time, uh, by me anyway, uh, the, the uh, University of Alaska study. Uh, I, I know Ted was there also, and uh, what did you think about the event, Ted? I thought the event was fantastic. As you mentioned, a lot of folks there, a lot of positive energy. I think I have to commend uh, the Lawyers Committee and others for putting together such a great event. And I think also just because of all the, the positive developments that have been taking place in the last several months, in the last year, you know, I think that that also played a, played a role in that. And there was there was just so much to talk about and to update folks on uh, whether it was our efforts or the Lawyers Committee um, or some of these amazing speakers like Gary Null and, and Mark Crispin Miller. Um, I thought that was the first time that we got to see Chris Joya speak at an event outside of the auspices of the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District. And his speech was it was just, you know, mind-boggling, basically. It was, it was beautiful and urgent. And just his ability to express the moral aspect of this fight that we are all engaged in is really inspiring and, and breathtaking. And I'm just thrilled and, and deeply uh, grateful that he and his fellow commissioners and other people in his community are, are joining this fight and, and taking it to their own community. And Richard, uh, I thought your presentation, discussing much of the evidence that you've been, that you've discussed in the past, but also incorporating the, the findings from uh, the UAF study was very effective, very saying the nail in the coffin, really. You know, we, we obviously, we have so much evidence. The evidence is overwhelming. It all points in one direction. Um, but the reason that we embarked on funding this computer modeling study by engineers at the University of Alaska Fairbanks was to give a unbiased look at when you simulate different kinds of loads in this building, what can cause it to collapse. And the results of that unbiased research serve as the nail in the coffin. There's no question anymore. And the only thing that will prevent anybody from seeing the obvious today is denial. And this study will go a long way in helping millions of people in time, I believe, millions of people overcome that denial. And so seeing you there presenting the study was, especially after the four years of you know, oversight and hard work that we put into it, raising the funds to do it, um, it was very gratifying for me and I'm sure you to be there presenting that research. And uh, we have uh, Ansgar Schneider, who also appeared during my talk uh, by Skype from Germany. He had been denied entry into the U.S. Here's a physicist and a mathematician who's been invited to speak at the Association for Structural Engineering of Bridges in this country. And he had a very eloquent, uh, simple, simple to, to to mathematicians anyway. <laughs> Some of the rest of us got a little lost. But in 10 minutes, he showed exactly how the, the, the fraud of the NIST report, which relied on Zdenek Bazan, who two, two, two days after 9-11, uh, submitted a detailed paper obfuscating uh, the, the, the collapse. And 
here, this mathematical equation was shown by uh, Ansgar Schneider to be uh, completely in error. Uh, so that was uh, a fascinating opportunity for him to speak live uh, in the United States after having been denied uh, through our government, Department of Homeland Security, I guess, uh, who, who uh, wouldn't let him in the country. We still don't know the real reasons for that. But I also want to share that we had Mick Harrison there from the Lawyers Committee for 9-11 Inquiry. We had um, Bob McElvey, who spoke as well. Uh, Bob lost his son, Bobby, uh, and he's been ins- inspiring the Bobby McElvain Act. And then uh, Mark Crispin Miller was uh, extraordinary uh, on, in New York, uh, journalist and journalism professor. Uh, he, he has just been fantastic, really focused on the, the media and, and how corrupt uh, our media has been in, in refusing to report on the crime of the century, really. And then Rachel Hughes, of course, first responder at Ground Zero. Right. Very good event from what I hear. And I'm glad that Richard was able to speak there. And I want to make sure we get everything in. There's so much to talk about that uh, I don't know how we're going to fit it into the hour. But let's get to the press conference in D.C. Now, Ted talked about it at the very beginning. We got his impression of it. Richard, just give us your wrap-up of what happened there at the National Press Club and, of course, want to let our supporters know that we have a video right up at ae911truth.org. I and mean, it's good to hear about it, but better to see it for yourself. So, Richard, take the floor. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you've got everybody has to go to the website and, and check this out. There's four speakers at the National Press Club, you know, the most prestigious speaking event uh, opportunity in terms of getting in front of the media. Uh, we had uh, Fox News there and many other media organizations and Chris Joya started this off in uniform and just made an impassioned plea for the uh, announcement of his campaign justice for 9-11 heroes and uh, we were all just you know on the edge of our seat as he explained what got him so fired up Uh, I mean here's a first responder who who lived that day uh, on the pile and and was at or near or might have even seen Building 7 come down. I can't remember if he actually saw. Ted will clarify that. But um, I had the opportunity to speak after him and once again announce the, the Building 7 uh, finite element analysis, the re- release of this 128-page major university study. I was just honored to, to present this. And, I, and Bob McElvain, uh, talked about his experiences also uh, trying to get truth about what happened to his son on that day as he was entering the North Tower. He was blown back. It's, it, 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 the explosions uh, typified the injuries that led to his death. And yet explosions are not a part of any of the official stories here. And so uh, that's why Dave Meiswinkle updated everybody at, at the end of that conference as to why uh, he's uh, suing again the U.S. attorney uh, to force his hand uh, to tell us uh, uh, exactly how um, he's making progress on complying with the law uh, requiring him to impanel a special grand jury. So all in all, uh, I think all of us were very excited. We did several interviews with, with media representatives there afterward. And then we skirted off to Capitol Hill. That's right. And I was very impressed with Dave Meiswinkle's speech. I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to be cross-examined by him. Just a very dramatic speaker and uh, very powerful. And everyone there did a great job that day. Now, something I just want to note, Richard mentioned that there was uh, media at this event. And, uh, Ted, I want you to comment on this. Fox News showed up. They came with their cameras. They unrolled all the cords. They set up the cameras. Uh, and they got footage, we assume, <laughs> from doing all that work. But as far as I see, and I had family watching Fox News all day and all night to try to get some kind of report on uh, what happened there at the National Press Club with AE 9-11 Truth, and they didn't see any coverage. We haven't found any coverage as of yet. Ted, I just want to get your thoughts on that development. Well... <laughs> I don't have a lot to say, I guess, other than 
I think there was too much truth in that room for Fox to put it on the air. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But that is why the people in this audience are so important. I mean, uh, this is really a worldwide movement of people who have been called to action from their own instincts and from their own ambition to see justice be done. So we can't give up. And we can't get tired. We've got to keep on spreading this information. We're relying on you out there in the listening audience to help us bring this message forward and do the job that the corporate media is not doing for the American people. And you will be remembered for that, too, when this truth comes out. All right, let's talk about Capitol Hill. Big time, this is my favorite part of every anniversary that we've done in the past couple of years. First, I just want to acknowledge the great volunteers that we had show up uh, around one o'clock in the afternoon. Kelly David, our COO, was in charge of commissioning the volunteers to hand out packets to every office in the congressional buildings on each side. Every single office got hit. In fact, when I went to a congressional meeting, uh, I had one of the packets and the staffer commented that they had already received one earlier that day. So some people got their before me, which is just fine, just great. Uh, but Richard, tell our audience about what we did there in the halls of the congressional buildings, the halls of the congressional offices, uh, meeting with our representatives. Yes, well, thanks to these volunteers from the Washington, D.C. area, uh, we now know that all 535 congresspersons have the packet that we delivered. Um, and um, that included the Bobby McElvain Act. It included our petition demanding a new investigation signed by 3,000 architects and engineers. It included evidence about the destruction of the Twin Towers in Building 7 and a letter uh, from Christopher Joya explaining uh, why he's doing what he's doing and why he's not going to stop until they introduce the Bobby McElvain Act and until the U.S. A grand jury has been impaneled by the U.S. attorney. So um, our specific role, we had a, a couple of dozen appointments, and it took three teams of us to cover them all. But uh, I had the unique opportunity to uh, speak with the representative from Iowa, Steve King, who unfortunately is, is uh, embattled uh, right now due to remarks that he's made that were controversial but I found him to be uh, very attentive to the evidence. And it, this is a unique experience for us because, you know, we've, we've spoken to aides and we've spoken to reps. But uh, there's been a few experiences, and Ted and, and Andy have some too here to share. But Steve King was looking at the evidence. For instance, the photograph of the uh, Twin Towers during its explosion, he said, that looks like a waterfall. That doesn't look anything like a collapse, which, of course, gave me the opportunity to explain that four-ton structural steel sections are ejected laterally at 80 miles an hour, landing 600 feet in every direction, trailed by thick white smoke clouds. Yeah, there's your waterfall, the evidence of thermite, which he asked about specifically. Well, where does that come from? Who makes that? You know, the nanothermite particularly. Uh, he was deeply interested, so I'm going to be following up with him, as did his constituent, who has already written him a letter thanking him for meeting with us on his behalf, uh, this Iowan uh, supporter of AE911 Truth. Bob McElvain impressed him as well uh, with his personal story, which always opens the heart of these um, congresspersons. So that was the highlight of, of, of my appointments right there. I found that everybody was attentive. Everybody took notes, at least in my meetings. I'll talk about my experience, some of them that I had to go to because, uh, first of all, our supporters are so great. I mean, we put out the call to action to set up these meetings, and it was like uh, Walmart on Black Friday. I mean, so many supporters were writing to their Congress members. Uh, you know, I knew I was going to have a busy month when I looked at my inbox the morning after that bulletin went out. But these, this is a good thing. This is what I want. And we had so many appointments that we did have to split the teams. Uh, I went and covered some of them myself. And I actually met with Congresswoman Vicki Hartzler and her staffer. She's a representative from Missouri. 
And I consider that to be a successful meeting. No, I didn't get a commitment to pass the Bobby McElvain Act out of it. But she was attentive as well. She asked some questions. I could tell this might have been the first time that she was encountering this information. And we all know that experience. The first time hearing about Building 7, the first time hearing that there's any problem with the official story of what happened to these three towers. Uh, The first time hearing that there were three towers instead of two. We know what that is like, so uh, most of us don't want to comment immediately. She did have to leave a little early to go vote on the floor. I finished up with her staffer, and I had printed out a copy of the Building 7 study for myself to have, because I like to just have reference materials when I travel for one of these events. I only had that one copy in my bag, and I decided to give it to Vicki Hartzler's office. I just made that decision to do it right on the spot. So I do plan to follow up with them as well, but I thought she was a very nice lady, and I feel like our information was at the very least respected and listened to there. So we'll see what happens there. There were meetings with other representative staffers, that we went to throughout the week because it wasn't just on the 11th, it was on the 12th and the 13th. And I thought a lot of those interactions went well. Some of them I went to uh, with Ted too, so I'm going to let Ted comment on some of them. Uh, Ted, you had your own group there and you saw uh, many uh, offices as well. So tell us about your experience that week. Yeah, so just like you, Andy, this part of the um, of our efforts around the anniversary was very gratifying for me. And I was, as they mentioned, we had to break into a few groups in order to cover all the meetings that we had. I was in the group. It was sort of the New York, New Jersey, Philadelphia axis, where there was me from New York, Commissioner Joya from Long Island, Dave Meiswinkle from New Jersey, and Helen McElvain joined us. And, you know, the McElvains live in Philadelphia. Uh, and so we focused on a lot of the New York congresspersons. We met with Senator Kirsten Gillibrand's office. We met with three other representatives from the New York area, uh, including Kathleen Rice, who was uh, Christopher Joy's representative, uh, representing the Franklin Square and Munson Fire District area, as well as Congressman Swazi. He is a district neighboring that district uh, where Franklin Square is. Uh, and then uh, a congressperson who I think most people are familiar with these days, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, we met with her office as well. We also met with a handful of others, and I met with with Andy and Kelly David uh, the following day. I would say, by and large, I think that just what the supporters did in terms of doing the outreach to try to arrange these meetings was incredible. It just paved the way for us to go in there and and have some really, really meaningful conversations, you know, the likes of which we we did not quite have in the last couple of years. We, We had some good conversations here and there in the last two years, but this year, three times a charm, it, it just, you know, trumped, it vastly trumped what, what we did in the last couple of years in terms of having really productive conversations. By and large, I, I just want to say a little bit about some of the materials that we brought there. We, we had a letter from Christopher Joya, uh, which was really important, and the packets all had the sort of the emblem of Franklin Square Months of Fire District on them. Also, the materials just generated out of all of our efforts in the last month or two were extremely effective. We went there with the Bobby McElvain Act, which we've been promoting for the last couple of years. And you hand them the Bobby McElvain Act, you've got a picture of Bobby on the front, and immediately you've opened their heart. And then we gave out the abstract of the UAF WTC7 study to every person that we met with, so the cover and the abstract, along with a one-page summary of the YouGov survey that we commissioned that all of our supporters who donated in the past month made possible, it was a relatively short survey, which we've done in the past, um, but it had been a few years, where you show people, because this is an online survey, you can show people the collapse of Building 7, explain to them that this building came down late in the afternoon on 9-11, and ask them what they think is you know, the more likely cause. Are you sure it came down because of controlled demolition? Do you suspect it did, but you're not sure? Uh, or do you suspect it was fires, or are you sure it was fires? And I encourage anybody who's listening now to go to aeunitedlovetruth.org forward slash yougov, all one word, Y-O-U-G-O-V. The results of that survey are consistent with what we've seen in the last five years, but they're even tilting more in our favor, which is a two and a half or three to one majority of people who see the collapse uh, either suspect or are sure that it was controlled demolition compared to a very small minority who suspect or are sure that it was fires. You then ask them, Are you more inclined to believe the critics who say that it was explosives who brought the building down? Or are you more inclined to believe the government, which says that office fires brought it down? And you get the same lopsided margin. About 50% of respondents say they would believe the critics, which is us. And about 20% say that they believe the government's account that it was was fires. Um, You ask them then, 
who would you support a new investigation? Uh, there we get a three to one margin, 48% saying that they either strongly support or support investigation, and that's about half and half, compared to 15%, a tiny minority of 15% who say they would oppose a new investigation. And so you have that hand in hand with the abstract of the UAF study, and like that's what members of Congress need to see. They need to see that if they were to suddenly champion this issue and that the video of Building 7 was seen more widely, that at most there would be 15% of the country that would be opposed to what they're doing, and the vast majority would, would either agree or at least be indifferent and not sure. But, you know, so to have that hand in hand, and then if a staff is sitting there, you're showing them the video of Building 7, and then you say this is the video that all of these people who took the survey watched, uh, and you got a three-to-one majority saying it looks like a controlled demolition, which one do you think? You know, and, and the, st- the staff right away is like, you know, you, you suddenly feel crazy for thinking that it's fires, which is how anybody should feel if they think fires brought that building down. And then you pair that with a four-year computer modeling study that says there's no way that fires brought it down. And, um, you know, I'll just say this. I think everybody understood in those meetings that we were serious and they took us very seriously. And we see a real path forward to making this happen, to getting the Bobby McElvain Act or something similar passed in the next few years. That's just the beginning. It takes a lot more meetings. It takes a lot more public pressure. It takes the fire service uh, throughout New York State getting on board. But there is a path forward, and it's not necessarily the long path that we're all afraid it might be. No, I came out of this very hopeful, and it was great to have Richard down there, the whole team, because we're all geographically, most of us are geographically located different places of the country and when we come together we do some really good things and you bring the volunteers in doing all their work handing out these packets it becomes excellent and i also want to give a quick compliment shout out to our members of our staff and family of the staff who had to help us put that packet together we don't think about these kind of things or or mention these things when we talk about our outrages but to have these packets we had to actually physically put the papers in the envelopes and that is no small task we had a a whole uh, night here turned this office into a factory, and a lot of people worked really hard that night. So I want to compliment them. I know one of them is listening to the show uh, right now. He listens every week. So uh, I want to mention this too, Ted. Uh, We did something that we didn't advertise that we were going to do when we were down there uh, regarding the oversight and science committees. You want to briefly introduce this outreach to our audience? Yeah, I do, because there's... because there's actually something that, that people can do right now to make a difference. And, and this is just one of the several ways that we are going to be advocating with Congress to take action here. We did put out a notice, I think it was the day before the 11th, September 10th, asking supporters to contact both the House Oversight Committee uh, and the House uh, Science Committee, um, asking them to hold a hearing or investigate um, the difference between the UAF WTC7 report and the NIST WTC7 report. Um, For people that have been following this issue really closely for many years, uh, you might remember that the House Science Committee is the committee that has, you know, held a number of hearings on the NIST World Trade Center investigation, you know, where you've seen the likes of, you know, the NIST director and Sean Sunder and other folks report back on what the NIST investigation did. This committee has direct oversight of NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and we believe this committee has a direct responsibility once the final report, the final UAF WTC7 report is published by the end of the year, to hold a hearing, to look at how did another university in this country, engineers at another university, come to a conclusion so radically different from the conclusion that NIST reached. And we'd like to see that hearing include Dr. Halsey. We'd like to see that hearing include Dr. Sham Sunder from NIST and others who were responsible both of the NIST investigation as well as the UAF study. And we're making the same request of the House Oversight Committee, which is the main investigative committee in the House of Representatives. And so we, we sent out that message. I'm sure <coughs> dozens, if not more, people contacted those committees throughout last week. We also made a stop to every single member of each of those committees, hand them a letter from Richard, asking them to do exactly what I just laid out. Um, and in, in, including, you know, along with that letter, we included the abstract of the study, and we, we included the, uh, the YouGov survey uh, one-page summary that I just mentioned as well. And this is really powerful materials. I mean, I think it, to the people that have not looked at this issue in the past, um, we're looking at it for the first time in these congressional offices. Uh, there's probably a lot of 
eye-opening, soul-searching, um, maybe a little bit of cognitive, cognitive dissonance, but hopefully not too much, uh, happening, and people are really starting to look at this seriously for the first time. And so our supporters throughout the country, A, you can contact the House Science Committee or the House Oversight Committee directly. If you go to our website, ae911truth.org forward slash justice, it is the page that we have for the Bobby McElwain Act, but there's also information about reaching out to these two committees, the House Science Committee and the House Oversight Committee. You can also look at the members of those committees, and there's approximately 40 members, 40 members of Congress in each committee, so these are not small committees. If you look at who's on those committees, and if it's your member of Congress, contact, call them, write them today, tomorrow, this week, soon, ask them to review the draft report. They already got the letter from us, so they should be but it is public pressure, it is numbers that get these people to really act, and so that's key. So everybody out there who's listening to this can play a role, whether it's calling the, the, the committees themselves. If, you're, if, you don't, if your representative is not on one of those committees, you can still call the committee, ask them to look at the report. And if one of your members or your member is on those committees, please call them or write them. Absolutely, and typically I end these shows with sort of a final wrap-up thought, but there is no final wrap-up thought because we are still in the midst of it. The story is still continuing and we are moving forward and we are not done and so we need your help out there to make this happen i think we've got the best chance right now than we ever have of getting some kind of justice regarding this issue with the building seven study out the bobby McElvain act ready and waiting to go so many great impassioned people out there. You've got Chris Joya coming out. You've got the lawsuits going on. I mean, it is a full frontal assault on the official story, on the official lie that we were given by Nest. And we need your participation out there in this most important battle for truth and justice in U.S. history. So, guys, we are out of time. But I want to thank you so much, first, for all the work you've done over the years, for all the work I saw you do when we were in Washington, D.C., and uh, thank you again also for coming on 9-11 Freefall today. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Andy. This program is on every Thursday night on No Lays Radio at 10 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Pacific. You can also keep track of the archives by going to 911freefall.com. This is Andy Steele. Have a great week. Good luck. 